Good evening everyone, time for another member update. So this is the 15 minute chart of silver and you can see here that we did get some volume coming in. It wasn't the type of volume I was predicting which I was expecting a, another large sell-off which we may get going forward. But you can see that we had a big volume spike. I'm going to pull it out here to show you how big that is. That was um, came in when the market tried to roll over and then huge buying came in. Now as soon as that buying rally kind of topped off, we had more selling into it and the price came down and made a new low in the, in the short term sense. And it was met by another large buying spike, which takes us to where we are right now. So it is a fairly large buying volume. If we pull out here, you can see there's the spike in volume. That's the largest we've seen since July here and since in late April. So it, it's a large volume spike. Is it enough to make a bottom? I'm kind of halfway 50-50 on that one. So we'll have to see follow through volume and uh, prices rising from here to make this uh, a rally bottom. Um, there's just no way to know at this point, but uh, it, it looks like there is some buying coming in at around a floor of 17 that they've seemed to set. So it's still 50, 50 cents above that 17 price, uh, a very good price to buy and uh, a way to just stack continuously waiting for a new low if, if that's what you're doing. So I want to look at the Puerto Rico story. This is a story that has kind of been swept down into the memory hole and I wanted to revisit that because my original contention when I covered the Puerto Rico situation was that the purpose of the Puerto Rican bailout was to save the larger financial system and to prevent some type of contagion. And I think that's exactly what's happening here. Now I'm going to dig in very deeply into this control board and what's going on there. And I'm going to show you that this is actually a microcosm of what is coming to America. And it's actually going to have the same key figures involved. So this is a story from the 4th and uh, these are protests. Now I, I'm not, I don't know if it's going to be covered here, but when I was reading the story, the meeting that the control board had, they had it on Wall Street. The protest actually occurred near the Wall Street Bull, so they didn't even bother to jump on a plane and meet in Puerto Rico. But let's read this and then we'll dig deeper. A congressionally chartered control board tasked with fixing Puerto Rico's debt crisis has been stacked with banking industry executives and facing mounting public opposition. Quote, no to these asshole promises. This is slavery. Stop pillaging Puerto Rico. These shouts from dozens of protesters last Friday dominated the first public meeting in Manhattan of Puerto Rico's fiscal control board created by the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act, or PROMISA. Congress passed the act in June in response to Puerto Rico's debt crisis. But local resistance to PROMISA is mounting as the unelected control board has usurped the island's sovereign government and is poised to demand more austerity without investing a dime in economic development. So now keep this in mind here. This is going to be the left's argument. And I've pointed out from the very beginning here that nothing will succeed without a bailout. Now so far they have avoided the bailout. I'm absolutely certain that they're going to bail them out at some point, but they've avoided that so far by mouthing these uh, cuts, uh, austerity, and tax increases, which we know Puerto Rico is a really good example because there's absolutely no way it can work. The austerity means cutting the people who work for the government, which is virtually everyone, and the tax increases means taxing those same people, which is essentially a cut in uh, in government employees pay. So there's no way out of the situation, but this is how they're trying to spin it. Years from now, when these consequences are felt, 
Puerto Rico's 3.5 million citizens will undoubtedly question why a Democratic president agreed to sign the law and why his emissary, Antonio Weiss, boasted about it. Weiss, a 20-year investment banker at Lazard who became counselor to Treasury Secretary Jack Lew in 2014, has embarked on a victory tour telling Bloomberg and the Huffington Post how he personally brokered the Puerto Rico legislation through Congress by presenting himself as the architect of Promesa, Weiss took ownership of its results that put him in a uniquely bad position, especially now that the control board's deep banking industry ties have been revealed. Promesa, Spanish for promise, passed amid an atmosphere of crisis. Supporters insisted it represented the only hope for Puerto Rico to avoid a chaotic $70 billion debt default. Now, does that sound familiar? Remember the... 2008 financial bailouts. Remember that it was the sky is falling. We have to do this or everything will collapse. Well, of course, what happened? We know what happened is that they took all that money, as John Titus has documented, and they stole the money. And uh, they didn't fix anything. They just printed a bunch of money and propped up the markets. Quote, they tried to put it in biblical terms, says House Democrat Luis Gutierrez of Illinois, Promise's biggest critic on Capitol Hill. Can't you just hear it? You will be healed. You will vanquish your sickness with Promisa. You don't think a hedge fund's going to get paid even though your kid doesn't have a school teacher? Despite numerous experts offering options to pressure creditors outside of congressional action, the perception that there were only two choices, Promisa or a catastrophe, damaged the outcome. So this is, I'm not going to read this further here, but uh, you get the idea. And this fits right into the general story that they always do. They pit the fake right against the fake left. But I wanted to dig down and look at this character, this Antonio Weiss. And uh, we're really going to dig deep on this because I think this is fascinating. This is going to show you uh, what is in store for America. So this is this character, Antonio Weiss. And what is interesting here, you have to read between the lines, but he was appointed, a, they attempted to appoint him as a undersecretary at the Treasury. And keep that clear, that was the Obama administration. This is not a Bush administration. This is not a quote-unquote conservative administration. This is the Obama administration that attempted to point appoint Weiss as an undersecretary to the Treasury under directly under Jack Lew, and it was blocked by a uh, single fold effort by Senator Elizabeth Warren, who, in my opinion, is just another actor on the stage. But uh, he ended up being appointed as a consultant. So let's read this. Antonio Francesco Weiss. It's kind of interesting. He appears to be Jewish and Spanish. Perfect uh, appointee for Puerto Rico. Is a counselor to the Secretary of the U.S. Treasury serving since January 2015. He advises on a broad range of domestic and international issues, including financial markets, regulatory reform, job creation, and fostering broad-based economic growth. He was previously head of investment banking for Lazard, a global financial advisory and asset management firm. Here's the standard resume for the insiders. Weiss attended Yale College and received his MBA at Harvard Business School, where he was a Baker Scholar and Loeb Fellow in Finance. Weiss joined Lazard in New York in 1994 and became a partner at the end of 1998. From 2001 to 2009, Weiss based was based in Paris, France, where he served as a vice chairman of European Investment Banking for Lazard and subsequently global head of mergers and acquisitions. Transactions on which he advised include Reynolds American, American's acquisition of Lorillard, the merger of Rockwood and Abermarl, the acquisition of Berkshire, acquisition by Berkshire Hathaway and 3G Capital of Heinz, mm, there's more connected people, the sale of DE Master Blunders to JAB and pending merger with Mendelez Coffee, Anheuser-Busch's acquisition of Grupo Modelo, Google's acquisition of Motorola Mobility, 3G's acquisition of Burger King, Kraft's acquisition of Cadbury, KKR's 
and KPE's merger in BEV acquisition, et cetera, et cetera. After his nomination, they don't really give you the details here, but what happened was that Obama nominated him as an undersecretary and it was blocked by Elizabeth Warren, so he was appointed as an unofficial advisor. There you go. After his nomination to be Undersecretary of Domestic Finance at the Treasury Department was opposed by Senator Elizabeth Warren, Weiss served the Treasury as an unofficial advisor beginning in early 2015. In 2016, as a public debt crisis brought Puerto Rico to the brink of default, Weiss helped to broker a U.S. law that restructured Puerto Rico's debt, imposed a financial oversight board on the protectorate, and limited minimum wage and overtime protections for Puerto Rican workers. The law was criticized on the right by fiscal conservatives unhappy with the possible cost to U.S. taxpayers and on the left by advocates for workers and for the Puerto Rican autonomy, but was heralded as, quote, the only piece of major economic policy to pass Congress to date in 2016. Weiss is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and has a long-standing interest in policy matters. He co-authored the December 2012 Center for American Progress Report, Reforming Our Tax System, Reducing Our Deficit. Now, I'm going to review that report here in a bit after I dig deeper into Weiss and his connections. So here we have a Wall Street banker, and he's in charge of reforming Puerto Rico, Supposedly, we're told that they're going to have a series of tax increases and um, spending cuts. That's the same mantra that we always hear. And we're going to see the nonsense that he spews about how that's happened under the Obama administration. But I wanted to look at this expose on Weiss that was done by, obviously, a left-leaning organization but uh, sometimes you have to go to either the far right or the far left to get the truth on these people because they're in the center uh, representing the moneyed interests, posing as the left, posing as the right. But we all know they all represent the same people, the Wall Street bankers. This is called the Antonio Weiss Files, Vultures, Bribes, and Conflicts of Interest in Puerto Rico. Antonio Weiss, Lazard Ferez, and the Puerto Rico Crisis. Antonio Weiss must be recused from decisions on the Puerto Rico crisis. Treasury official Antonio Weiss is currently leading the Treasury Department's response to the Puerto Rican debt crisis, but Weiss received a $21 million golden parachute from his previous employer, Lazard Ferrez, an investment bank with numerous ties to the Puerto Rican debt crisis. Lazard traded in Puerto Rican debt. Former Lazard partners incentivized Puerto Rico to underwrite more debt with Lazard. Lazard has reportedly invested in Puerto Rican debt, and Lazard partners have come under scrutiny from law enforcement officials for unethical and or illegal business practices related to debt underwriting, including in Puerto Rico, for bribery, kickbacks, and conflicts of interest. The relationship between Lazard, Ferrez, Weiss, and Puerto Rico is fraught with conflicts of interest and ethical tangles. How could Treasury Secretary Jack Lew and President Obama allow Weiss to leader their team on Puerto Rico? Well, here's the confused left here, not understanding that Obama is just another puppet of the Wall Street banks. Since arriving at Treasury last year, Weiss has brought along yet another former Lazard colleague to assist on Puerto Rico issues. It's not at all clear whether the U.S. government team working on the debt crisis has the interests of working Puerto Ricans in mind or the interest of hedge funds and investment banks. The $21.2 million golden parachute raises questions about Weiss's independence from Lazard and Lazard's ties to the Puerto Rican debt crisis raise questions about where Weiss's loyalties lie. From top Lazard bankers accused of bribing Puerto Rico's governor for favorable roles in debt deals to their role in advising vulture hedge funds on how to invest in the island, Lazard is totally intertwined with the Puerto Rican debt crisis and Antonio Weiss and his golden parachute millions are totally intertwined with Lazard. Giving questionable allegiances, Antonio Weiss is the wrong person to handle the treasurer's response to this crisis and that's exactly why you're getting him. 
We are calling on Antonio Weiss to recuse himself from all Treasury activity relating to Puerto Rico and the island's debt crisis. In 2014, Antonio Weiss was put forward for appointment to the Treasury as Undersecretary for Domestic Finance. Now keep that in mind. We're going to look at his domestic finance proposals because I believe they're actually going to try to put this character, this criminal, this scumbag, this filthy monster in charge of our debt restructuring. I'm going to show you his paper. At the time of the appointment, Weiss was pulling down in excess of $7 million per year as head of investment banking at Lazard Ferrez. While his treasury gig would have paid a respectable $167,000 a year, it clearly would have been a drastic step down in lifestyle for Weiss, who splits his time between his Central Park West paid de tier his historic Connecticut Mons, and his $1 million property in the Dominican Republic. Fortunately, Weiss's pals at Lazard had a plan. They'd gladly advance him his $21 million unvested income ahead of schedule. Who wouldn't want a pal in the Treasury Department, right? Weiss withdrew from consideration for the Treasury posting in, his January, in January 2015 following an outpouring of condemnation over his $21 million golden parachute. As a consolation, Weiss was installed as an advisor to the Treasury Department, a position that did not require congressional approval. Now Weiss is leading up the Treasury Department's task force on Puerto Rico, which is currently in the throes of a struggle with wealthy hedge fund managers. On the other side of that struggle, our group of hedge fund profiteers, aided in many ways by Weiss's former employer, the problems facing Puerto Rico are almost inseparably entwined with the actions of Lazard. In its advisory practice, Lazard has hosted meetings pitching hedge fund managers on investing in Puerto Rico's municipal debts. Lazard's fund of hedge funds is reported to have numerous clients, client relationships with the hedge funds that form the so-called Ad Hoc Committee on Puerto Rico a loose confederation of asset managers who were scheming to prevent Puerto Rico from obtaining the ability to declare bankruptcy, a move that would wipe out some of the island's outstanding debt. Lazard managed funds also have small positions in the island's bonds, and portfolio companies of Lazard's private equity arm have infrastructure investments in the island. Lazard has an interest in protecting not only fee income earned through their relationship with the hedge fund vultures that seek to destroy the Puerto Rican economy, but also their debt and equity investments in the island. Now, again, I encourage you to read this whole thing. Obviously, this comes from the left, and many of the less criticisms of the hedge funds are accurate. But remember, we have fake right and fake left. So, of course, when we look at the bonds here, uh, it turns out now that uh, the Puerto Rican bonds have turned out to be some of the best performing bonds of this year, even though they've actually had defaults. You can see here, uh, this is a chart of uh, the highway transportation revenue bonds. Here's a chart of the general obligation bonds uh, for 2020, a 5.5% coupon, and you can see since they passed that rescue bill, uh, we've had a rally in the value of those bonds. Now, as I said, when I first started covering these stories, that's the intent. That's, that's the whole purpose of this thing is to prevent any type of contagion, certainly preventing any type of default. And as they point out in that uh, paper, certainly preventing any type of bankruptcy. What they're interested in is keeping the system going to be able to milk as much money out of it as they possibly can before the whole thing collapses. Now, the whole thing is going to collapse, but they're interested in telling you that it's not going to collapse right up until the point that it collapses. And a perfect example of this is this paper by Antonio Weiss, Reforming Our Tax System, Reducing Our Deficit. So this is the person who is the advisor to the treasury, and there's some, been some very shady characters who've held that position. But this paper uh, is just a typical smoke and mirrors Washington paper, and this is Weiss's 
famous paper here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to show you the essence of it. Uh, this report offers a plan to achieve meaningful deficit reduction over the next 10 years that rests on two pillars, progressive revenue enhancing, efficient, simplifying, and pragmatics tax reform. That means increasing taxes and pragmatic spending cuts that do not undermine the middle class, the poor, or seniors. And that means no tax cuts at all. I'm sorry, no spending cuts at all until uh, it gets so dr uh, dramatic of a situation that they actually impose austerity. And I'm going to show you the smoke and mirrors that they have here uh, because you would want to drill down and look and see, okay, how are they planning to increase revenues and how are they planning to cut spending? Well, here we go. It's the standard Democratic Party line. Our tax plan would raise revenues in a progressive way, asking those in the top income brackets to pay more. On average, households making, and it, this is basically Hillary's platform. Uh, and then uh, they say they will, will simplify the filing process. So it's a bunch of nonsense. Uh, basically, they're going to imply that they're only going to raise taxes on the rich but we know that if you generate revenues from income taxes, then the number of people who are actually very wealthy that report income is a very small number. The billionaires and trillionaires, the 0.001% of the world, the 0.1%, the very, very rich, they don't have income. They shield their income through various uh, schemes. So what happens is, when the left proposes we're going to increase taxes, it's only going to affect the people who make 500000 or more in income. Then what happens is it gradually ratchets down until it turns into a tax crease on everyone across the board. That's what happens every single time. So let's look at the deficit reduction. He says here, of course, deficit reduction will not be limited to tax reform. Spending reform will also be necessary. It's important to note that the federal government has already cut spending substantially. Okay, now that is just simply a bold-faced lie. The reason why I continually show you the debt-to-the-penny deficit numbers is because these people lie through their teeth every day. They're lying to your face. They have not cut anything. Uh, they're using fake GDP statistics, debt as a percentage of GDP. All of this is a complete lie. In the last two years, President Barack Obama has signed into law $1.5 trillion in spending cuts over the next decade. Well, that's interesting. We're all, this is in 2012. We're already halfway through that next decade, and the debt under President Obama has doubled. We propose hundreds of billions of dollars in additional spending savings that can be achieved without reducing retirement or health benefits, without shredding the social safety net, and without further disinvesting in America's future. The result is a comprehensive deficit reduction plan that will substantially reduce our future deficits, set the budget on a sound course for the coming decade, and bring our debt to GDP ratio well below 72% by 2022. So that's what these people do. Uh, these people continue the system of stealing wealth using their Wall Street cronies. It's happening now in Puerto Rico. I don't know what the future is for Puerto Rico. Uh, my best guess is if they follow the pattern, then there's going to be a series of protests against the cuts that are going to have to be made. And because of that, the political will won't be there. It'll become another crisis, and ultimately there will be a bailout. They will take tax money, which is essentially now printed money because the tax revenues don't cover the expenses. So basically the Federal Reserve is going to print money and bail out Puerto Rico. But uh, these people, they never change. They're all from the same club. They come from the Council on Foreign Relations, they pretend to be conservatives, they play a game, and uh, they threaten the poor, uh, they enrich themselves and the rich, they propose reform that never works, never had any intention of working, but their reform 
mainly is to preserve a system that is doomed to failure, but they want to milk as much money as they possibly can out for their masters before the entire collapse commences. And we'll talk to you next time.